Listen to This Week in Money, Saturdays on Internet Radio at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This week's scheduled guests from Chartworks, Ross Clark. From the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, Mark Faber. From WolfStreet.com, Wolf Richter. Plus, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. Don't miss This Week in Money this Saturday on Internet Radio at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on. The Kinder Morgan Pipeline controversy continues in the courts and you have something new to announce about the taxpayers federation and that court battle that's right the canadian taxpayers federation are seeking uh, intervener status in the ongoing court case over kinder morgan so as the uh, province of british columbia is trying to go to court questioning about the substance that is coming through the trans mountain pipeline which has been federally approved by the official regulator and by the federal government under Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, we are seeking intervener status on behalf of taxpayers. Because projects like this and oil and gas and natural resources are so essential to our economy and to our prosperity, we feel that it's important to speak out on behalf of taxpayers. Because without a strong economy, without jobs like these, and without this lifeblood that is our modern world of oil and gas, we won't have money to pay for the taxes that are imposed on us by three different levels of government. So we think that it's really important that we stand up for taxpayers in this case and speak on their behalf in favor of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So we're seeking intervener status there. There's also talk, of course, that the federal and Alberta governments might guarantee Kinder Morgan's uh, success in the pipeline by backing them financially. Should taxpayers be putting their money at risk there? No, we don't think so. So this is one of those very frustrating things where we've had, up until now, a private company more than willing to wait for years, to go through years of hearings, through regulatory processes, and wanting to foot the bill themselves to build a massive amount of infrastructure for something that we all need, oil and gas. They were paying for it, and they were, in fact, paying for it even at the local level. In fact, Trans Mountain Pipeline is one of the biggest property taxpayers in the city of Burnaby. So they're paying at all different levels. And now, to have very few activists, some of them who happen to be in B.C. government, trying to blockade this federally approved project, and then to have the federal government and the Alberta government turn around and offer up taxpayer dollars in this mess, that no, that is a very bad idea. So we do not support them using taxpayer dollars in this fight. They shouldn't be having to backstop a private corporation that was more than willing to put their own capital up, to put their own money up. And so there we differ. Uh, we don't think that we should be throwing taxpayers' money into this, apart from obviously the amount of money and the expenses that are incurred by these constant court delays. What about the pipeline protesters threatening reporters who uh, have approached their camp that's built illegally on public land? This is one of those very frustrating things. And if I can take off my taxpayer's hat and put on my journalist hat, I was a journalist for around 20 years. And in fact, at one point, I was covering this big protest that was happening in New Brunswick over the issue of shale gas. And you re might remember that five or six RCMP uh, vehicles were torched. There was a big riot. And shortly after that, uh, myself and several other uh, news networks were on scene shooting what we call B-roll. It's visuals that you see on television when 
a reporter or an anchor is talking about something and they show moving pictures of it. So we were there doing that all in our, you know, our own company's time for our individual companies. And um, we were surrounded by protesters. They seized, if I can use that term, millions of dollars of equipment. They surrounded my car. They threatened us. And in fact, it got so bad that we had to take it to court and we won. So I have first-hand experience of what it's like to be a journalist and a reporter on the ground where people are angry over infrastructure or angry over the use of natural resources. And speaking as a former journalist, at no time is it acceptable to threaten people with physical violence. It's not okay. And especially when you're dealing with something like the press, we need to be able to tell stories. We need to be able to show people what is actually happening on the ground and to seek earnest and honest answers. And so when I saw that there were reporters on the ground, from what I saw from Global, who were being threatened, it just brought back those memories. And it's a big reminder that we need a free press in this country and that threats of violence are unacceptable. Well, I know the protesters say, well, why should we let TV cameras in the media is biased against us, so we don't want them taking our pictures. But how do you expect to get a positive story spun when you're threatening people? Yeah, exactly. That Well, in my opinion, it just shows the wrong-headed thinking of these protesters. So I don't think that their protest necessarily makes sense to begin with, and so it's sadly not a surprise that their logic or reasoning is absent when it comes to threatening a journalist. What exactly do they think is going to happen when they threaten a journalist? You know, do they think that they're going to be getting good press out of that? Do they think that their message is going to be well received by the average person who's watching the news and say, yeah, you're right, you should threaten that, jur- that journalist with violence? You know, that, that makes no sense in most worlds. And so in this case, it also doesn't make any sense. And so it's one of those things where if they're worried that journalists are biased, we live in the world of online and social media where you can have, in this case, your own radio program that reaches as many people who want to listen to it. Or you can have your own news website with blogging. You can even do your own video. You know, the idea that somehow you're being railroaded by one single, you know, monarchy of, of media doesn't make any sense, especially today, please. They have lots of people who are backing them, including some people who would be considered journalists online. So they're getting their message out in their own way, and there's no reason for them to go threatening, especially mainstream media who are there doing their jobs. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after the break. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, the NDP slash Green government of British Columbia has imposed what I call a super homeowners tax on homes worth $3 million or more. Now this, they're calling it a school tax. Is this really a school tax or just a cheap tax grab? This is a major tax grab, and it's not a school tax. What's really disappointing and crass about this is that they've labeled it a school tax, and they did that for a reason, so that people would glance over it in the budget like all of us did. Nobody caught it in the budget because you see school tax, and they're usually just marginal tax increases or decreases usually to do with with property. And so it wasn't caught until you actually start reading the fine print. And all of this money just goes back into general revenue, And what it is, is it's a 0.2% tax on every home valued over $3 million in British Columbia. So the value that's over $3 million gets a 0.2% tax increase every year. But if you take a look at something over $4 million, there's now a 0.4% tax increase for every valuation over the $4 million mark. And this is an annual tax. So say, for example, you've got a home that you bought in the 60s or 70s, the way a lot of that generation did, and it's ballooned in value underneath you, right? But you're still living there. It's your house. And I've heard from somebody who is in the exact that situation. They bought their house in the 60s or 70s. 
They've stayed in their home. They've worked hard to pay for their home through the high interest rates of the 1980s, and now they own it. They're living there physically. They need a place to live, and their home underneath them has ballooned to $8 million value on paper. And I say on paper because they don't want to sell it. They want to live in the dwelling that they're sitting in. So if you've got an $8 million house, that's a $4 million over and over and above the limit. If you times that by 0.4%, that's a $16,000 surprise tax bill for you. One that you did not have to pay last year that you've just been handed by this NDP government. And a lot of people in that specific region, funnily enough, in Attorney General EB's riding are in that spot. So you've got very long-term residents in some of these cases who are now being shocked by this massive tax bill. And the reason why they called it a school tax is so that when you start arguing against it, they can turn around and say, well, don't you care about children? Please. I think most adults who follow politics and follow the news can see through this very quickly. It's very similar to what they tried to do back in the 1990s when Glenn Clark was finance minister. They then tried to impose a tax, a property surtax, I'll call it, on homes valued over $500,000. Nowadays, that seems like a screaming hot deal, but back then, that was considered a pricey home. And so they nailed them with this tax. There were rallies in the street. They had to back down and back down quickly. And so now that they're back in power, they've tried this again. And all it is is just a max, massive tax grab, and they're hoping that they can play class warfare here. They're hoping that the average person who is struggling to make ends meet or buy a townhouse or even rent an apartment or a townhouse, even down the Fraser Valley, because frankly, you know, people on the other side of the Fraser and homes on the other side of the Fraser are too much to afford for a lot of people. They're hoping there won't be an outcry. But there's a reason why people, even those, who aren't living in and around Vancouver proper need to care about this. Because if we allow them to impose this massive property surtax on valued homes, valued, not sold, valued homes over $3 million, what's next? What happens next year or a few years from now when they've got a budget shortfall and they move the goalpost down? What happens when they start hitting homes that are valued over $2 million? What about $1.5 million? I went past a house on Dundas a few weeks ago that's tiny. It looks like it was built in the 1930s, one of those square kind of minor houses that you'd usually see back in that day. It was valued at 1.4 million on the busy, one of the busiest streets in Vancouver. So it would be very easy, very quickly to see this surtax applied to a lot of people, not just those in West Vancouver. And so that is why both because of this being unfair to the people who are living there and because of the threat for the future that people really need to pay attention to this. This is a huge surprise tax for a lot of people based solely on the valuation of their home, not the sale of their home, the home they're physically living in now. What about people who plan to leave their home to their kids when they die? That's a great point. So because of this, some people are saying, oh, well, just defer it. And so for people over the age of 55 or 65, I'm not sure what age it is, I think it's 55, you can defer, quote unquote, your property taxes until you die or you sell it. But the problem there is, say you take my family that has contacted me in the last few days that's owned the place since the 60s or 70s. Like I said, they busted their buns to pay for this house. They worked very hard. They want to leave their home to their kids. So that the next generation can put their kids in university, can stay in the neighborhood. These are long-time residents of this neighborhood. But guess what? Their adult children can't afford a $100,000 or $150,000 deferred tax bill that would be handed to them by this government, by this provincial government, when their parents die. Imagine being in that situation where your parents have passed away. They've got this house, which, yes, is worth a lot of money, but you want to keep it. You don't want to sell it. You want to continue living in your family home in the neighborhood that you've been helping to build over the last 40 or 50 years. And the provincial government says, you know what? If you want to keep it, you owe us 150 grand for a dwelling and a home that your parents built, bought, and worked to pay for. 
it's it's fundamentally unfair. And again, just wait. Right now, it's a three million. If this is allowed to happen and nobody raises a fuss, what's to stop them from dropping it down to two million when they decide that they need more funding? What does David Eby think about all these people who supported him and uh, gave Christy Clark the boot? Well, do you think they're going to continue to support them when they get a $16,000 tax bill? That's a really good question. And so what was really fascinating is over the last couple of weeks, he was supposed to have a town hall meeting. That's, of course, when an MLA or an MP or a city councillor, you know, sits in a legion hall or whatever building that they rent, and their constituents come in and let them know, you know, what their concerns are. He had this scheduled for weeks, and he cancelled it. Why? Because so many people were so upset about this so-called school tax, because the vast majority of them who are being hit by this school tax physically live in his riding, in his area, and he bailed on it. He said he's concerned about security, which is bizarre. I mean, people raise their voices, yes, but you need to keep it civil, of course. But yeah, he canceled it. So he needs to answer to his constituents who are getting handed this massive property tax hike. And also, uh, this isn't a school board tax hike, which would be a school tax. This is a provincial uh, hike. Yes, it is. And that's what's so crass about it. They just labeled it school tax. Like, it's not coming from from municipality. It's not coming from the school board. It's coming from Victoria, and they're labeled it a school tax. It's, it's, a, it's amazing the chutzpah that they showed labeling it this. And so that's why it's really important that people really pay attention to this. It isn't just one riding. It isn't a school tax. This is a property surtax, and it would be very simple for them to loosen the reins and start taxing your house, too. And, of course, it's on the latest assessment of your property value. And I can personally attest that uh, that property value can jump 52% in one year. It sure can. And, again, if you don't want to sell and you want to continue living in the house that you bought and that you're paying for or have already paid off, how is this fair? It's forcing you out of your home. And if it's not forcing you out of your home, if you happen to be a senior citizen, it's forcing your children to not have this asset that you want to hand to them when you pass away. Like, it's a fundamental violation of private property. Also, if they expect you to sell your home to pay this tax, high-end homes right now in the greater Vancouver area are not selling at all. Yes, exactly, and it's one of the reasons why. And then also you need to ask yourself, if they're so worried about massive turnover, right, of of homes and neighborhoods within Vancouver and the surrounding cities and, you know, people with, you know, just truckloads of money coming in and buying it and maybe not even living there. What do they think is going to happen if they start, if they impose this tax? Who's going to swoop in and buy the $8 million house that comes with a $16,000 brand new annual tax? Only multi, multi multi-millionaires would do such a thing. And we don't even have any guarantee that they physically live in the place. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, have you been getting any comments from uh, employers concerned about the payroll tax that will be imposed to pay for the medical services premiums that are supposedly going to be removed from the regular uh, taxpayer. Yes, I'm getting emails on this almost every day. And so for a long time, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation was advocating, arguing for an elimination of the MSP, the medical services premium, because it cost people a lot of money, it was punitive, and frankly, it costs a lot of money to administer. 
So by the time that the smoke cleared on the paperwork, the province wasn't taking in that much money through the MSP. So it made no sense. It was just a tax again. And so they agreed, the NDP, during the last election campaign to get rid of it. And we said that was a very good thing. What they didn't say is that they would simply take the MSP and slap it onto employers. And so that's exactly what they've done, unfortunately. In the last budget, they announced the employer health tax, which is going to be applied to every employer, meaning job creator, who has a payroll of over $500,000. That might sound like a lot, but if you take, for example, a really good restaurant that has you know, breakfast, lunch, and supper shifts, it's easy to get up and above the $500,000 mark, and small businesses, medium businesses, you name it, are being hit. Also, municipalities are being hit. That includes small towns, medium towns, big cities, because, of course, most of these townships have a payroll over $500,000. And guess what? They aren't allowed to run a deficit. So where's that money going to come from? From property tax hikes. So what this government has now done is downloaded responsibility for health care funding to cities and towns. And so cities and towns, along with small and medium-sized businesses, are up in arms saying, we weren't consulted on this. This is not our responsibility. You campaigned on an elimination of a tax, not the creation of a brand new one. And so that is why we're just getting inundated with emails and phone calls on this, because it's going to really hammer small businesses and townships. They're basically most people's property taxes at the municipal level are going to get hiked because of this new employer health tax. Well, also, charities that employ a lot of people are going to be hit with this tax. There's no exemptions. No, and so not-for-profits also have payrolls. Everybody has payrolls. You know, we we live in a a market system. We've all got pay... Most of us have payrolls. And, yeah, not-for-profits, charities, you name it, all have payrolls. And a lot of them have payrolls more than $500,000. And they have to keep in mind that not every employer had previously paid the MSP. Sometimes that was paid for by the individual. And what adds insult to injury is that for a year, they're double dipping. They've still got the MSP clinging on at 50%, and they're hitting employers with the payroll tax at the same time. That's actually how they managed to balance their budget in the last book. So it's it's really not fair, and it's we're, we've been calling on the NDP now to cancel this outright. They said they ran on canceling the MSP. They did not run on imposing an employer health tax, so much so that they had actually commissioned, back when they had their budget update in September, they said they were having an outside panel examine ways of replacing the MSP. We wanted them to find savings and efficiencies within their current and existing budget without imposing a brand new health tax. And governments waste so much money, there's no way that they can tell British Columbians with a straight face that they couldn't find that amount of money when they take into account the lack of paperwork, right, if you you cancel it altogether. What we didn't want was for them to take the interim report from the panel, didn't even wait for the final report, and simply run with it. So they didn't even wait for the final report of this independent panel that was taking a look at how to find funding. They just took an interim report, like a mini-update, ran with it, and slapped a payroll tax on every employer. Well, if they were going to replace the premiums and make the system fair, why not base it on your income so those who make the most would pay the most? They could look at that, too. That's something that the panel was examining. But since the NDP already grabbed it and ran with it, I mean, it's almost a done deal. Again... Back when uh, my predecessor, Jordan Bateman, did uh, work on this, he found that the administration costs, the paperwork costs of the MSP, were so high that it just didn't make any sense to constantly tax people for health care, which is funded by the federal government by and large and then administered by the province. It's just an extra fee to hit people with so that they continue their big spending. And so, again, it's one of those things where people really pay attention during election campaigns And when you say you're going to cancel something, but you don't come clean and say, by the way, I'm going to shift it on to employers with payrolls over 500,000, it really breeds mistrust. And that's why we're calling on them to say, you know what, you know, we're getting huge backlash over this. 
we're not only hitting small and medium-sized businesses, but we're really, really hammering municipalities. It was wrong, and we're backing off of it. So that's what they need to do. Well, Carol James has been famous, I think, for, I guess, voicing opinions that apparently make her think that eating the rich will make everybody else wealthier. See, this is the thing, is that it's so easy to just say somebody else will pay for it. Well, if that somebody else pays for it, that means that they have less money to invest in the economy. They have less money to pay even other forms of taxes. And just wait, because the tax bracket will eventually fall onto you. Also, if you're just always saying somebody else will pay for it, that really stifles and strangles achievement and striving. We should all be aspiring to do as best as we can, to work as hard as we can, to save as much as we can, to make as much money as we can. Because if not, we're languishing, right? We're going stagnant. But if you have a government policy that says you're going to chop the heads off all the tall poppies, we're never going to grow. And so you just can't take that philosophy into our modern era. Well, I've also heard uh, some small businesses say they'll have to lay off employees because of this tax because they're going to try to get underneath that $500,000 cap. Yes, exactly. It's very similar to what happened, especially in Ontario, when they forced the minimum wage hike through. One, it bumped a lot of people into a different tax bracket, so it actually wound up making them less money. Funny how that works, right, when government's involved. But also, the money comes from somewhere. You know, that bake shop or even that restaurant that you think is doing really well, that money comes from somewhere. They need to pay their employees. And if government forces them to spend more money, they're going to have to make their book balance and they will lay people off or they won't make that new hire or they won't expand to that next location. It it strangles entrepreneurship and expansion. And this is why it's just fundamentally and philosophically wrong. Oh, there's also another uh, court challenge that uh, you're getting involved with. Uh, that's Saskatchewan's battle against the carbon tax. Yes. And so as everybody knows, uh, apart from British Columbia having the highest carbon tax rate in all of Canada and it no longer even being called revenue neutral, even though that was just a silly label that meant nothing, Saskatchewan is standing up and fighting back against the federal government. We wish that British Columbia would do the same, but, you know, there's just no spine for that right now, unfortunately. But Saskatchewan is standing up, and so they're opposing the Trudeau government, imposing a federal carbon tax upon them. And so they're taking it to court, and the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we see that they're in the fight, and so we've come over the boards and we're getting involved in the scrap. And so we're seeking intervener status there as well to speak again on behalf of taxpayers arguing against the carbon tax. The carbon tax is one of our main issues, hands down, across Canada. If we ever ask our our supporters what they care about most, carbon tax is almost always the top issue for them across the country, including here in British Columbia. Well, it's so ironic. Canada already is one of the cleanest Nations on Earth, we produce, I think, either 1% or Mm -hmm. less than 1% of greenhouse gases. We're the coldest country on the planet. and We're awash with all kinds of uh, natural wealth when it comes to oil and gas. No break for people there, especially if you live in the Vancouver area. Canada is the only country that produces oil and gas that doesn't give its own citizens a break. It is, and it's one of those things where it's so frustrating We can see people working so hard in the oil sand sector, not even just directly in it, but there's tons and tons of companies that supply them with everything from boots to gloves to hard hats to housing, you name it. I mean, there's even like a housing company that's in New Brunswick that builds modular housing and they ship them like Lego pieces across the country. It's amazing. You know, a huge number of people in Atlantic Canada rely on the oil sands for work. They're just, they live on WestJet. They fly back and forth all the time. Like, it is the engine of our economy. And to see government just dumping, you know, sand in our gas tank is just mind-boggling. And at the same time, we're importing oil and gas that we'd call from conflict zones, from places like Saudi Arabia and, and Venezuela that treat people just terribly and who have 
horrible environmental records. And so here we have Canada with some of the best working conditions, the best labor laws, the best environmental regulations and laws, and we're getting treated like this. It's just, it's so frustrating. And further, you're right, Canada is gorgeous. We have one of the cleanest, most pristine environments. We have very careful uh, environmental laws that protect our ecosystems and protect our habitats for all types of species, including endangered species. And when we export oil and gas products, we often benefit other parts of the planet. So if we're, say, exporting something like natural gas to China, that means that they can continue fueling their industrial revolution that they're in the middle of right now and maybe not use their version of coal because their version of coal is really dirty the way they do it. But we've got so many brilliant people in this country. We've figured out all sorts of ways to capture carbon, to capture special forms of gases that come off of these different natural resources. It's amazing. And one of the reasons why the issue of Saskatchewan is so interesting is that if you drive around there and you talk to people, farmers in Saskatchewan, for example, manage to reduce their CO2 emissions which is, of course, a major natural element on Earth, but they still reduce their CO2 emissions without a carbon tax. No carbon tax, they still reduce their emissions. Why? Because we're technologically striving for excellence all the time. Farmers, especially, are always looking for ways to make themselves more efficient and to innovate, especially through technology. A lot of people may may not think that, but there's a lot of tech that goes into modern agriculture. But guess what? the feds still want to hit them with a carbon tax. So if this is all about emissions, why are they still imposing a tax? Why? Because it's not about emissions. It's about just getting more money out of us. And so they're calling it a carbon tax, very similar to the way the NDP government is calling this property tax a school tax. It's just a shell game. What about BC Hydro saying they don't want to pay people who put power down the grid from their solar panels? Hmm. I haven't, I haven't seen that issue there. So are they trying then to say that they're not going to give them breaks on their power or they don't want to contract out and pay them for their power? They don't want to pay for the excess power the solar panels will give out. Whereas in California, the government is encouraging people to put power down the grid so they don't have to build more infrastructure. Hmm. That would be something I'd have to take a look at, frankly, in order to give an educated um, assessment of it because I just came back from Ontario after living there for almost 16 years. And their hydro system is a disaster, like a flaming wreckage disaster. Uh, People's hydro prices usually quadrupled, quadrupled in the last 10 years. And one of the major reasons for that is because of their green shift that they called it out there. So they had put through the Green Energy Act and in some cases uh, signed contracts with solar and wind companies for outrageous amounts of money sometimes for 30 years if you can believe it so well, in, in this Ontario's case so the yeah in this case so the homeowner has paid the cost of putting up the solar panels and as a byproduct they have excess power so why not put it down the grid so bc hydro doesn't have uh, apparently one of the excuses hydro has is that if everybody did that they wouldn't have any customers <laughs> I don't think everybody's going to do that to the extent that they wouldn't have any customers, especially now that so many people are trying to shift over to electricity. You know, we'll always have this massive amount of demand for electricity. More and more people are demanding more and more of it. Again, I'd have to take a look at the details to give a good analysis of it. But in general, if it doesn't cost taxpayers money and it doesn't jack up your hydro rates, which is very important to point out, then, yeah, that kind of seems like a no-brainer. But it's, again, something I'd have to take a really good look at. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. As always, thank you very much. My guest has been Chris Sims, B.C. Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Her website, taxpayer.com. If you have any questions for Chris or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.